Hi, good morning, everyone. Hope you all must be doing good today. In the last lecture, we were discussing PGBP, uh, some of the important sections 40 small a, 40A2, and 40A3. We have discussed. Let's recap them once again because these are quite important sections. And today, also, I'll be discussing very important sections, also, and that too from examination point of view. Section 40 small a, which we did last time, it says it has some points. First, our first of the point was if you are making payment outside India, if you are making payment outside India or to a non-resident, if it is interest, royalty, fees for technical services or even any other amount which is chargeable to tax in India, right? So it is your responsibility, the person who is making the payment, it is their responsibility that you have to deduct the TDS during the previous year and also deposit such TDS up to the due date of ROI. If it is done, we are happy, no problem at all. But if any of the condition is not satisfied, TD is not deducted during the previous year or it is not deposited up to the due date of ROI, we are going to disallow it 100%. We are not going to allow, right? And can it be in any subsequent year, can it be allowed? The answer is yes, it can be allowed. Whenever such TDS is deposited, it can be allowed. But here the exception is salary. If salary is paid outside India or to a non-resident and it is disallowed because TDS was not deducted or it is not deposited up to the due date of ROI, then it will be disallowed. 100% it will be disallowed. And even if the TDS on such salary which is paid outside India to a non-resident, even if we have paid the TDS late, it will never be allowed. Its salary component will never, never be allowed, right? Second point in section 40 small a is that if you are making a payment to a resident that is within India, if you are making a payment and on such payment, TDS provisions are applicable. I'm repeating on such payment, TDS provisions are applicable. Then assessee, while making such payment, please deduct TDS during the previous year, deduct TDS, same conditions, deduct TDS during the previous year, deposit such TDS up to the due date of ROI. Both the conditions are satisfied. Okay. Allowed any of the condition is not satisfied, 30% of such expense will be not allowed. 30% we will disallow and remaining 70% can we can allow. No problem with 70%, 30% will disallow. And yes, this 30% remaining which we have disallowed this year, it can be allowed in subsequent year also whenever such TDS is deposited, we are going to allow it. So these two points are very important in section 40 small. Some other points are like, if there is any expense which is related to income tax or provision for income tax, please don't allow such expense, right? Income tax, provision for income tax, penalty for income tax, please don't allow it. GST or custom duty is allowed? Yes, GST is allowed, custom duty is allowed. Obviously, subject to 43B, if it has been paid up to the due date of ROI, that we will see today, section 43B, right? Because section 43B has some points. And first point is any type of tax or sales payable to government, it is allowed. It is allowed in section uh, 37, right? GST and customs duty is allowed under section 37, but subject to 43B that we will see today. Okay. And then another point in section 40 small is that if you are paying, if you are paying salary to your employee, you are paying perquisite to the employee. And also if you are paying tax on non-monetary perquisite for the employee, if you are paying tax on non-monetary perquisite, we understand it is a burden on the SSC, it is an expense for you, but we are not going to allow it. This is not allowed under PGPP, right? Tax on non-monetary per user paid by the employer. In last class, I have already discussed what is this amount. Last point is that if you are contributing to any retirement benefit, uh, benefit fund that is approved or recognized or statutory, it is allowed, right? But you have to make it sure, please make arrangements that whenever the amount will be withdrawn from such funds by the employee, TDS should be deducted. So you have to make sure that TDS arrangements are made. If TDS arrangements are made, then it is okay. If it is not made, then 40 small a will disallow. But I tell you this point is not that important from examination point of view. But yes, it is part of section 40 small a. Okay. Next section, which we discussed last time was 40A2, 40 capital A2. It says that if you are making a payment to a related party, we, we know who are related parties. If you are making a payment to a related person or specified person 
and if it is an excess of fair market value, it is an excess of fair market value, then such excess will be disallowed, right? Last section which we discussed was 40A3, very important. If you are making a payment that is more than 10,000 rupees, more than 10,000, up to 10,000 it is okay, but if it is more than 10,000 rupees to a single party in a single day, to a single party in a single day, then we are going to disallow it if it is made in by way of cash, bearer check or cross check. These three are not allowed. If you want to make a payment of more than 10,000, you can make it through account pay check, account pay bank draft or any banking mode like NEFT, RTGS or UPI, you can make such payment, right? There are certain exceptions also. For transporters, we can pay how much? Up to 35,000. And there are some other exceptions also, which we discussed last time, right? That if you are making a payment, for purchasing agriculture produce and that to making the payment to the producer, the cultivator that it is allowed. You are making a payment to RBI, SBI or any banking company or to government, then it is allowed. So I, I believe that you remember those points which we discussed in 48. There are some two more sections, two, although very small section, 48, 7 and 49. Let's discuss them also. So if you look at your screen, you will find. Give me a moment. Okay, you can look at it. Section 47, it says that disallowance for provision of gratuity. See, if you are making a payment towards approved gratuity funds, let me explain this with an example. Let's say there is an SSC. Uh, let me take the company HUL, Hindustan Unilever Limited is a company, and they are depositing contribution to this is uh, their PNL account and they are saying this is contribution to approved gratuity fund. Let's say for any employee, they are making a contribution of 1 lakh rupees every year. They are making a contribution. Let's say there is an employee, Mr. X. This person is an employee. He is working with the uh, HUL Limited and HUL is contributing in approved gratuity fund. Tell me whether this expense of HUL is allowed or not. Answer is yes. Section 36 says, Section 36 says that if employer you are making a contribution, that is employer contribution to recognize provident fund or to approved um, any approved retirement benefits fund like gratuity and etc. It is allowed under section 36. It is allowed under section 36. And yes, 43B con uh, conditions will also be applied over here. We will see 43B today. It says that this amount sh you should contribute HUL, Hindustan Unilever Limited. Please contribute, please deposit this amount in that fund up to the due date of ROI. My question to you is that HUL Limited is making, it's showing an expense of 1 lakh rupees. Are they paying this 1 lakh rupees to the employee or are they contributing to a approved gratuity fund. You will say that this HUL is contributing to an approved gratuity fund. So let me imagine, let us imagine that this is the fund. Correct. This is the fund and this HUL is contributing 1 lakh rupees every year, every year for this employee Mr. X. We are contributing 1 lakh rupees. So this amount is depositing, getting deposited in the fund. So in this year, 1 lakh rupees is deposited. Next year, again, HUL will contribute. 1 lakh rupees will be deposited. This is with respect to employer contribution. Although we understand employee will also contribute, but let us concentrate on employer contribution. So HUL, this year, 1 lakh is contributed. Next year, 1 lakh rupees will be contributed. Next year, 1 lakh rupees will be contributed. Tell me whenever H, uh, they are contributing to approved fund, it is allowed or not? The answer is yes, sir. Every year it will be allowed. Let's say in this fund, now it has an amount of rupees 20 lakh because every year an employer was contributing. Now this fund balance is 20 lakh rupees. And this is very logical. Tell me, let's say this employee, Mr. X is getting retired. He's getting retired. And now we are paying 20 lakh rupees from such fund. From such fund, we are paying to X. We are now paying to X. Tell me in this 20th year, in the year in which we are paying this amount from this fund, can HUL say, sir, this is now my expense of rupees 
20 lakh and in this year, let's say this is 20th year, right? So in this year, can HUL say that, sir, we are paying gratuity to of rupees 20 lakh to our employee. Please take it as an expense. The answer is no. Why? Because how was this fund contributed? Sir, 1 lakh rupees was getting contributed every year. And every year, it is allowed to the SAC. We are allowing it as an expense. We are already allowing it as an expense. So we cannot give him double deduction, right? So if this amount is paid from the approved funds, which has already been claimed every year, HUL was any HUL or any other employer, in this case, HUL was claiming deduction over here. So if any amount is being paid from such fund, it cannot be again allowed. It cannot be again allowed because it will lead to double deduction. Correct. So this was section 40A7 specifically clarifies. 40A7 specifically clarifies, say if you are contributing to approved fund, it is allowed under section 36. But whenever from such fund, from such fund, any amount is contributed, any amount is given to the employee, then you cannot claim a deduction further, right? Because it will amount to double deduction. This is section 47. It says if provision for gratuity is made towards approved gratuity fund, the provision is made to approved gratuity fund, then it is allowed under section 36. We understand. No issues. However, if any payment is actually made to the employee from such fund, if any payment is made out of such fund, it will not be again allowed because it will lead to double deduction. Simple section 40 small a, simple small and sweet section. 40 a9 and in fact sweeter. Why? Because it simply says that if you contribute to unapproved fund, it will not be allowed. We understand any contribution by the SSC to unapproved fund, we know it will not be allowed. Even if the SSC is saying, sir, we are contributing to this unapproved fund and we have scientifically calculated the amount, sir, there is some actuary. There is some professional, Mr. Actuary is there. You know, you understand who is an actuary? Actuary is a person who is uh, a professional who is very good at cal calculations, right? So mainly in insurance sectors, they are used. Uh, they, they work. So it's a very dignified degree again. Not more than chartered accountant. Yes. Uh, equivalent. Okay. So come coming now. So if any amount is contributing uh, contributed to such unapproved fund even if it is made by actuarial valuation we are not going to allow it so any contribution by ssc to any unapproved fund shall not be allowed even when they are made by actuarial valuation correct so these are very small sections but again it can come in your examination you should know this simple sections let's come to sec let's come to section 41 section 41 is deemed business income because we understand. In fact, we have done some of this section in bits and pieces somewhere or the other. When I was discussing with you uh, terminal depreciation, balancing charge, in case of power generating unit, I have also given the reference of section 41. When I was discussing with you scientific research section 35, I have given you the reference of section 41. When I was discussing with you section 36, it was recovery of bed debts. Then also I have given you the reference of section 40. And we understand and also in section 29, 29 was computation of PGBP. When I was explaining that there are a certain income which falls under PGBP. So charging section 28, there are certain incomes which comes under PGBP and also section 41 that, that is deemed a business income, right? So section 41 is deemed business income. We understand recovery of bed debts we have already done that whenever the bed debts is recovered, whenever the bed debt is recovered, it will become our business income, deemed business income. Section 41 specifically says deemed business income. Although it might happen that in the year in which this bed debt is getting recovered, let's say the assessee has already closed down, down his business. Now he no longer, he is not, uh, no longer into that business. He is not continuing that business. Even in any year, if such amount is recovered by him, then it will become deemed business income. So it is an exception to the rule that there is no business, but yes, business income can arise if any bad debt is recovered. That is section 41, right? There are other points also. We understand sale of scientific research asset. If SLM method is used, we understand. Uh, do, do you remember that number line I have taught you in section 32 also in, while uh, discussing power generating units and while discussing section 35, I have discussed a number line. Let me explain it once again. 
let me take the example of section 35 okay section 35 we understand it is of scientific research let's say we have purchased a machine in first year in any year let me call it first year we have purchased a machine of 10 lakh rupees and that is for scientific research purpose for sr purpose tell me what treatment we will give it to uh, give this uh, 2 rupees 10 lakh so we will claim 100% deduction under section 35 because we understand that under section 35 if you, if you uh, incur any expense it could be related to revenue it could be related to your capital 100% deduction is allowed so 100% deduction will be allowed under section 35 we understand in the first year itself tell me if 100% that is 10 lakh rupees reduction will be allowed because we have purchased this uh, machine this capital expenditure we have incurred Tell me the written down value of this machine now. Sir, we have already claimed 100% deduction. The written down value comes to nil. Do you remember this number line? So let me tell you the original cost was how much? 10 lakh. The written down value is how much? Nil. Let's say after 2 year, 3 year, 4 year, 5 year, whatever the case may be, we are selling this asset. We are selling this asset directly without using into normal business we are selling this asset right let's say it is getting sold for rupees 6 lakh we are selling it for 6 lakh tell me the written down value of the asset is nil because we have already claimed 100% deduction under section 35 now we are selling it for rupees 6 lakh so whatever the income which you will generate which is between this nil and 10 lakh it will be your deemed business income covered under section 41 it will be your deemed business income so if you sell this asset for 8 lakh, 9 lakh, 10 lakh, it will be your deemed business income. And tell me what if, if you sell this asset for more than the original cost, let's say you sell this asset for 12 lakh, we understand from nil to 10 lakh, this portion is your business income under section 41 and over and above 10 lakh would be your capital gain that we will see under section 50A once we will be discussing capital gain after PGPP, right? So uh, 12 lakh minus 10 lakh, 2 lakh would be the capital gain. It depends if it is short term then it is 2 lakh if it is long term then 12 lakh minus index we will do our indexation of this 10 lakh whatever the amount will be it will be long term right okay so this was section i was i'm discussing right now section 41 so section 41 we have discussed under section 35 also same with uh power generating unit also in also in that case also same uh case may might arise let's say if you are depreciating your assets on slm basis slm basis means on individual asset we calculate depreciation let's say the written down value of your asset is right now let's say it is power generating if it is let's say 8 lakh 8 lakh the written down value of the asset is 8 lakh because uh, let's say 1 lakh 1 lakh depreciation you charge every year on slm basis and right now the written down value is 8 lakh and if you sell this asset the power generating asset for more than 8 lakh up to 10 lakh so this area is PGPP and we call it, we give a special name to it, although it is covered under section 41, but in power generating, we give it a special name that is called balancing charge. Do you remember balancing charge? And if it is more than 10 lakh, you understand it would be capital gain. Yes. And if it is less than 8 lakh, do you remember? It would be a terminal depreciation. In that case, that is, it is a kind of loss or you can say it's a kind of expense. We will allow it's a terminal depreciation under section 32. Okay. So this is section 41, deemed business income, recovery of bed debts claimed earlier. Recovery of bed debts which is claimed earlier. This is important. Let's say if there is any bed debts in any earlier year, but it was not allowed in that year. It was not allowed in that year. And if we recover such bed debts which were not allowed, will it become income again? No, it will not become income again. So only, do you remember this section 41? So whenever the bed debts is recovered, which were claimed earlier, which were claimed earlier, when you recover such bed debts, that becomes your income. I believe that you remember that. We have discussed this in a regular lecture. You must remember this. Sale of scientific research asset we have covered. Sale of power generating units asset on which SLM depreciation charge we have covered balancing charge. And recovery of any expense. Let's say we have incurred any expense earlier. We have incurred any expense earlier and we have already claimed that. And now it is getting recovered or there is any trading liability which is no longer a liability now which is no longer a liability now 
so it will again become our business income i give you the example of a cessation of trading liability what is cessation of trading liability means let me give you one more example let's say there is an assessee mr a mr a is carrying a business he is carrying a business and in previous year let's say 2021 some four years back in previous year 2021 he has purchased goods of rupees 2 lakh so he has made from mr b let's say mr b is the supplier so mr a has purchased goods of rupees 2 lakh purchases account debit this would be the general entry you don't have to pass any general entry in taxation paper but i am just giving you an example so let's say mr a is carrying a business and in uh, last uh, um, in uh, let's say before four years he has purchased uh, goods of rupees 2 lakh purchase account debit 2 lakh let's say to mr b 2 lakh he has not made the payment he has not made the payment to mr b but yes we understand that expenses can be allowed on due basis because we understand there is section 145 which says that if any uh, how we will compute pgbp income as per the method of accounting followed by the sse if a CSE is following mercantile basis, then we will all be allowing all expenses, all income. We will be considering all income also that to on mercantile basis, right? So we will be allowing this in this previous year. Let's say if I make a PL account of this year, so it will be allowed, right? To purchases two lakh rupees, it will be allowed in this year. And although we have not made a payment to Mr. B, so Mr. B is our creditor. So in our balance sheet will show Mr. B as a creditor. This will be a liability. He will be shown as a creditor, Mr. B of rupees 2 lakh. Let's say we have not made the payment to Mr. B and up to this year, we have not made the payment. There is no issue. This expense will be this will be allowed, will be allowed on due basis. There is no problem. We can allow this expense. Let's say next year also in previous year, 21, 22 also, we have still not made the payment. This is balance sheet of this year. Next year also, Mr. B is sitting as a creditor of 2 lakh rupees. What will happen? Nothing will happen. We have already claimed an expense, but we are not making a payment to him. Next year also, in previous year 22, 23 also, in this balance sheet also, Mr. B is sitting as a creditor of 2 lakh. We have still not made the payment. And in this fourth year, let's say in previous year 23, 24, in our balance sheet, we have written this two lakh rupees off. We have we are writing it off, so we are not we are no longer supposed to make a payment to Mr. B. Mr. B was uh, tired asking of his money, but we are not making him a, him a payment. And after three years, now he has stopped coming us uh, coming to us also for his money. He has stopped calling also. He is not visiting us also because he now understands that he will not get money. We are not going to pay him money now. So what we have done, we have written off our trading liability. This is our trading liability, right? Because in our business, we have, there was certain liability with respect to creditor. And now we, it is ceases to exist. It is ceases to exist. We are, what we are doing, we are writing it off. So in this case, you have already claimed an, an expense of 2 lakh, but have you spent it anything? No, we have not spent anything. We have not given a penny to anyone. How can you claim 2 lakh rupees? So in this year, Whenever your trading liability ceases to exist, it will become your deemed business income. So in this year, 2 lakh will be, become your deemed business income because you have already claimed an expense where you have not spent a penny. How can you claim an expense? How can you save your taxes on that amount where, which you have, which is actually not an expense, right? So in this year, we will make it as an income under section 41. So this is section 41 deemed business income. Correct? Okay. Next is section 43B, expenses allowed only on actual payment. This is a very important section, section 43B. Uh, there are few sections that are very, very important. And this is one of them. This is one of them. I would highly request you, recommend you that you should know this section by heart. At least the number also. Not only the provisions, not only the content of this section, but you should remember this section by heart. There is section 43 capital B and this year it becomes more important due to an amendment. Due to an am amendment, this section is now more important for our 2024 examinations. Okay, let me discuss this with you. Section 43B says that there are certain expenses 
which are allowed only when they are paid only when they are paid up to the due date of ROI and if we have not made the payment it will not be allowed irrespective of the method of accounting followed by the SSC because we understand generally SSC follows mercantile basis right generally SSC follows mercantile basis and we allow such expense on due basis on mercantile system on accrual basis we allow even if we have not paid we will allow this expense but there are certain list of expenses so these are list of expenses see one two three four five six and one more seven is now introduced over here so there this is this is a list of seven expenses section 43b says that regarding these expenses regarding these expenses they will only be allowed if actual payment is made up to the due date of and if we have not made the payment up to the due date of ROI, we are not going to allow it. We will disallow it. 100% we will disallow. It. But yes, it can be allowed in any subsequent year also. It can be allowed in any other subsequent year also. Whenever the payment will be made, in that case, it will be allowed in that year. But if this payment is made up to the due date of ROI, we will be allowing it this year also only. But if it is not made up to the due date of ROI, we are not going to allow it will be allowing it in the year when it is actually made so what are the expenses which are here mentioned in 43b first is any type of tax or cess payable to government any type of tax or cess which is payable to government so we have done section 43b i have given you the reference of section 43b first time when we were discussing section 30. in section 30 i have already mentioned that expenses related to building rent repairs insurance rates and taxes of building so there were taxes of buildings right so it was it is again any type of tax so i i have already mentioned there that taxes are allowed under taxes of building taxes are allowed under section 30 subject to 43b because why because it is any type of tax which is allowed only when it is actually paid section 43b list which covers such of such expense also any type of tax sources whether gst or custom duty is allowed answer is yes we understand gst and custom duty can be allowed under section 37 again subject to 43b why because it is any kind of tax sources of course income tax cannot be allowed so you cannot say you cannot say that i have made the payment of income tax before the due date of roi please allow no we're not going to allow it because section 40 small a has already disallowed income tax or provision of income tax etc right Second point here under section 40 small b uh, for 40 capital B is bonus or commission. If you are paying bonus, if there is any expense of bonus to employees or commission to employees, we understand it is allowed under section 36. But this bonus should actually be paid to the employees or commission should actually be paid to the employees. You can pay it during the previous year. Even we are giving the time up to the due date of ROI. If it is paid up to the due date of ROI, we will allow it this year. But if it is not paid up to the due date of ROI, up, up to ROI, we are not going to allow this year. And we can allow in any subsequent year whenever this amount will be paid to the employee. Right? 30% will be disallowed. Yeah? Entire will be disallowed. Entire. 43 we says entire will be disallowed. 30% was just one thing which we discussed in section 40 small a. That is, if you are making a payment to a resident within India on which TDS provisions are applicable, their 30% provision was there. And here 100 percent will be disallowed okay we did any type of tax we did bonus or commission third is interest on loan if you have taken a loan if you have taken a loan from you understand if you take loan for business it is allowed under section 36 right but if you have taken a loan from any bank financial institutions including specified nbfc specified nbfc's who which are specified in nbfc we don't have to do just remember specified nbfc so if you have taken a loan from any bank financial institutions or specified nbfc's then such interest is allowed if it is actually paid up to the due date of ROI. if it is paid we are okay but if it is not paid that interest you have not paid up to the due date of roi we are not going to allow it we are not going to allow it 43b says no if this interest is if you have taken a loan from your friend if you had taken a loan from any of your any of your relative and you have not paid the interest we are okay with it 
section 36 will, six will say it will allow me it will be allowed and it is not subject to 43b it is only subject to 43b when it is taken from any bank financial institutions or specified nbfc right and you also know that if that interest is not paid we have just converted that interest into another fresh loan if we have converted that interest into another fresh loan we will say no sir interest is not paid we have just converted that interest into another fresh loan so if asethi will have taken a loan to repay that interest so that will not be allowed only when such loan is paid we will assume that interest is getting paid right do you remember this point also okay next point is that employer contribution to provident fund superannuation fund or other road welfare fund we understand it is allowed under section 36 subject to 43b we already know this leave salary if you are making a payment of the of the leaves which are not availed by your employee see we understand we have we did this in the salary chapter that there are leaves also if employee uh, does not avail such leaves then we can give him payment so this is called leave encashment leave encashment is an expense for the employer it is allowed can be allowed under section 37 but subject to 43b this amount should actually be paid up to the due date of hour. and sixth one is any amount paid to indian railways for use of their assets so if you are using any of the assets or any of the services of indian railway and if you are making a payment to the indian railway it is allowed such expenses allowed but actual payment must be made up to the due date of ROI. If it is made up to the due date of ROI, okay, we are going to allow it. If it is not made up to the due date of ROI, we will disallow it. So these six points were already there. It's in this year also it is applicable. This one more point is added and it's a very important point which is added over here and you can mark it important. You can mark it important because here this is an amendment also. It says and this point is a bit special point why because it does not deal it does not refer due date of ROI no in all these six points which we already discussed just now here I was saying that you can make the payment up to the due date of ROI let's say your due date of ROI is 31st July or your due date of ROI is 31st October you can make the payment up to that date but here the law is quite strict here the law is quite strict it says that if you have purchased anything, if you have purchased anything or you have taken services of MSME, micro, small and medium enterprises, right? MSME, micro, micro, small and medium enterprises. If you are making a payment, if you have taken any, if you have purchased anything from them or if you have taken any services of, uh, from them and you have to make a payment to an MSME, you are making a payment to MSME this can be allowed on accrual basis this can be allowed on accrual basis if that payment is made as per the msme act as per the msme act we don't have to read anything about msme act but i'm mentioning over here that if payment is made as per msme act we are going to allow it on accrual basis but if the payment is not made as per msme act then we are going to disallow we are going to disallow it on a cruel basis and whenever the payment will be made then we can allow such expense let me explain this to you with the help of example let's say there is an assessing x limited it's a company x limited is rsc and in previous year 23-24, let's say this is the date 25th March 2024, they have purchases, they have made a purchase of rupees 5 lakh from MSME. So there is MSME micro small micro small and medium enterprise there is one msme we have made a purchase x limited has made a purchase x limited is a customer and msme is a supplier and on 25th march 2024 we have made a purchase from them 
but we have not yet made the payment. We have not, it is not a cash purchase, it's credit purchase. So we understand uh, that before that, before this amendment, we understand that any kind of purchase or any kind of expenses can be allowed. If it is not at covenant 43B, it can be allowed on due basis. Even if you have not made the payment, it's okay. It can be allowed on due basis, right? So before this amendment, we used to allow it. If Even if you have not made the payment, it's okay. Now, this point is added in this section 43B. This point says, 43B says that if you have to make a payment to MSME, it's, this payment can be allowed on accrual basis. Accrual basis means that it can be allowed in this year, provided this payment is made as per MSME Act. So what MSME Act says is, MSME Act says that whether there is a written agreement between the two parties or there is no written agreement. Okay. So it tells us whether there is a written agreement. Written agreement is there. Yes. Or no. Right. So first we'll understand if there is a written agreement. If there is a written agreement, it says that this person should make the payment as per the written agreement, as per the, as the number of days which are mentioned there in the written agreement, you have to make the payment up to that date. Okay. Let's say it says, and it also says that the number of days, if it is more than 45, this 45, you should remember. If it is more than 45, then we cannot take more. It should only be limited to 45. So I can say like this that if there is a written agreement, so whatever the number of days are mentioned here, number of days are mentioned, you have to take as per those written agreement or maximum 45, which sorry, I have written rupees or maximum 45 days, whichever is lower, whichever is low. So if, if in written agreement, it is mentioned that you have to make a payment um, within 20 days, 25, 30, 35, 42, 43, 45, we are okay with that because it is less than 45 days. But if in written agreement it is mentioned that you have to make the payment in, let's say 46 days, 47 days, 50 days, 56 days, no, maximum how much we have to take? Only maximum 45 days, right? Okay. So let's say there was a written agreement and between these two, there was a written agreement, yes. And between these two, it is mentioned that number of days was, let's say 52. In the written agreement, it was mentioned. Then we have to take how much? Maximum 45. So you should make the payment within 45 days. Okay. Let's say, let me take this one. Let's say X Limited is now making a payment. X Limited is now making a payment. For example, they are making a payment on 15th April 2024. They are making a payment. See, on which date we have purchased this? On 25th March, we have purchased it. And just after 20 days, we are making a payment. After 20 days, we are making a payment. Tell me, is it getting paid as per the written agreement? The answer is yes, it is getting paid as per the written agreement. Then we can, if it is getting paid as per the written agreement, we will say, okay, it will be allowed on accrual basis. Because here the maximum number of days, let's say was 45, it was 52 over written, but we cannot take more than 45. So we have taken 45. Whether the payment is getting made within 45 days, the answer is yes, it will be allowed on accrual basis. So when, if it will be allowed on accrual basis, then in which year it will be allowed? This year, previous year 23, 24. So it will be allowed in this year, previous year 23, 24, we are going to allow it. But let's say this was case one. This was case two. There was a written agreement, right? Let's say if we would have made the payment after 45 days, if we would have made the payment after 45 days, okay? Let me take it. We are making a payment somewhere in 24th of May. 2024, we are making a payment. See, 25th March. If you calculate 45 days, it will be somewhere on 25th of April. And it will be somewhere on 5th of May, right? And now here we are making payment on 24th May, which is much beyond 45 days. So tell me whether the payment is made as per the written agreement. The answer is no. Maximum we have to take 45 days, right? If it would have been lesser days, 
here it was 52 that is the reason i'm taking 45 let's say if here it was written just 40 then we will take, take where i would have taken 40 or 45 whichever is lower i think that is easy correct okay if i'm taking a second case that we are making a payment on 20, 24th may 2024 then it will not be allowed on accrual basis it will be only be allowed on payment basis then it will be allowed on payment basis right and on which year it is making up on which date we are making this payment 24th of may 2024 and when and in, in, in which year it is falling it is falling in previous year 24 25 so we will allow this in previous year 24 25 we are not going to allow in this year you can ask me sir this payment is getting made much before due date of roi let's say it's due date of roi is 31st july let's say it's a company let me take it the due date of roi is 31st of october so sir here the payment is getting made much before the roi due date please my dear students here in this case of msme we don't have to see roi due date we have to see only msme as per the msme act so it says that if there is a written agreement whatever the days are mentioned in the written agreement please take those days or 45 whichever is lower 45 these, these are the days which you have to learn or 45 whichever is lower so written agreement was 52 or 45 whichever is lower is 45 so if you make the payment within these days we will allow it on accrual basis if you will make the payment on after these days then it will not be allowed on accrual basis we are going to allow it on payment basis only and the payment is getting made in this year so this expense will not be allowed in 23 24 we are going to disallow it this is very important that is the reason i am explaining it to you again and again i'm taking a time over here it's a revision lecture but still i would like to emphasize emphasis on this point correct because this is something which is very important it will i expect that this will come in your examination 43b is any time an important section and if there is an amendment it becomes much more important okay so these are the payment dates right these were the payment dates and after some time i'll ask you to uh, write it also you can take a screenshot and you can write it later okay so, so first part we have done if there is a written agreement if there would not have been any written agreement so if if says that sir there if there is no written agreement there is no written agreement if there is no written agreement here you have to make the payment within 15 days you have to make a payment within 15 days and if the payment is made within 15 days we will allow on accrual basis and if the payment is made after 15 days we are going to disallow it on accrual basis and we will allow only on payment basis okay so here let me if there is no written agreement let's say here also i'm giving you some cases it's quite light let's say there's no written agreement on which date we have purchased on 25th of march 2024 this is 25th of March 2024 we have purchased. Let's say we are making a payment on 4th of April. 4th of April. 4th April 2024 we are making a payment and there was no written agreement. First of all tell me whether the payment is getting made within 15 days. Answer is yes. We have purchased on 25th of March. It will count till 4th of April. So it will not be more than 15 days. So it is up within the 15 days limit so it will be allowed if the payment is made within 15 days then accrual basis accrual basis and if it is not made within 15 days then only on payment basis so let's say i'm making a payment of this on 14th april 2024 so if we'll count from 25th march till 14th april it is more than 15 days so here it will be allowed on payment basis only so if it will be allowed on payment basis so it will be allowed in previous year 24 25 right if it was an accrual it was allowed in previous year 23 24 so this is within 
15 days and this is after 15 days i believe that you have understood this correct you can write it also let me write it 25th of so you can write this example so on 25th march 2024 you have made a purchase of 5 lakh rupees from this msme so it says this point says that if there is a written agreement you have to make the payment as per the written agreement or 45 days whichever is lower if the payment is made as per the written agreement or 45 days whichever is lower as the case may be then we will going to allow it on accrual basis but if the payment is made after the written agreement or 45 days as the case may be it is the payment is getting made after that then we are not going to allow on accrual basis we will be allowing on payment basis only second part if there is no written agreement we will give you 15 days if you are making a payment within 15 days accrual if you are making a payment after 15 days then it will be on payment basis only this point was very important you can pause the video here you can write it down i would strongly suggest you to write this down okay okay i'm changing the screen so this is an amendment important amendment when amount is payable to msme if the amount is payable to msme very important please make it very important so see i have already mentioned that from point 0.1 till point 0.6 it was up to the payment should be made up to the dividend of roi but here seventh point is a bit special here the payment should be made up to the date as per msme act it says that if is the payment is made as per the written agreement written agreement says that payment must be made as per the agreement maximum we have to take 45 days if it is made as per the agreement or if there is no agreement we have made the payment within 40 within 15 days then it will be allowed on accrual basis but if in case we have made the payment late that is if there is an agreement but we are making a payment late or we are making up if there is no agreement we are making a payment on 16th day or after 15 days then it will be allowed only on payment basis it will not be allowed on accrual basis very important amendment right so i'm keeping it till here right now i'm not well i'm not keeping well these days uh, in fact i have not posted the video for last two or three days so after a day or so i'll be uh, regular with this so uh, we are keeping it here some part of section uh, some part of pgvp still left so i'll be continuing this in my next lecture till then thank you so much bye take care